Hi, I'm Andrew, and in this video I'm going to present the paper Agree to Disagree on Labelling Helpful App Reviews. Um, if you're interested in more details in this paper, have a look at the OSCHI 2016 conference proceedings. Now, app reviews are an essential part of app marketplaces such as the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. Users leave reviews on apps to warn other users of buggy apps or to recommend apps that provide a good user experience. Developers can read these reviews in order to refine their own apps, but developers can also look at reviews for other apps in order to decide whether or not they want to enter that space and hopefully create a better app that provides a better user experience for everybody. But as I'm sure you, you're aware, if you've read through these reviews, you've probably noticed that some of these app reviews don't seem so helpful. So the question comes, how helpful are app reviews? And is there some sort of way that we can automatically separate the helpful reviews from the not so helpful reviews? So there's been some fairly large scale studies in the past of reviews for physical products, uh, usually coming from Amazon.com. But there's been considerably less research into the helpfulness of app reviews specifically. In the studies that I've looked at, usually they've relied exclusively upon the helpfulness scores coming from the app marketplaces as their sole indicator of how helpful a review was. Now the issue with that is op often those official helpfulness scores are calculated from a small number of user feedback, thumbs up or thumbs down, yes this was helpful, no it wasn't. And what's more, since users can see other users' helpfulness ratings, that tends to bias their response. In contrast, we've taken a sample of reviews from the iOS health and fitness category, and we've conducted our own survey where we've distributed those reviews out among our participants and asked the participants to provide um, helpfulness on a like it scale to tell us how helpful each of those reviews are and we've co collected a decent number of responses for every single one of those reviews. Okay, so here's an example of one of the reviews that we put to our participants. This is for the Calorie Counter free app. It's titled, What Happened? Since the update, my calorie counter isn't working. I loved it before. Frowny face. And they've awarded this app two out of five stars. Now the question that we asked our participants and something that I'd like you to think about because I'm about to put this out to you, the audience, later on is do you find this review useful in your decision to download this app? And the answers are one, not very useful at all, three to five, very useful. So take a moment to think about that because I'll come back to this question later. Overall, um, our participants found reviews to, in general to be slightly useful. Uh, that said, there's a good chance that this is specific just to the app category that we looked at. The real question is, how do we separate the helpful reviews from the unhelpful reviews? So, when we looked at the number of stars that a review awarded, surprisingly, we found that didn't actually have much impact on whether our participants found those reviews helpful or not. Regardless of whether we're looking at a five-star positive review or a one-star negative review, both have the potential to be either helpful or unhelpful uh, with a similar distribution. When we looked at review length, we found there does seem to be this overall trend where up to a point, the longer reviews are generally considered to be more helpful. Um, in order to get as many responses from our participants as possible, we didn't make our participants justify their responses to why they thought a review was helpful or not. 
Um, but it makes sense that the longer reviews are going to contain more information, they're going to be generally a bit more informative, and so it makes sense that they would be uh, considered generally more helpful. And this is in alignment with what's been found previously for reviews for physical products. That said, um, overall trends can be a bit misleading, which is why I'd like to take us back to that specific app sample of an app review that we looked at before. Okay, so for you, those of you uh, watching the online video, um, I'd like you to let me know in the comments below how you would have responded uh, to this question if you had been part of our survey. Um, so I'd like you to tell me, do you find this app review to be useful in your decision to download this app on the scale of not useful at all to very useful? Um, and if you could, if you could provide a reason in your response as to why, because I'd be genuinely interested in that. Okay. Uh, the only thing I ask is please don't look at how anyone else has rated this prior to coming up with your decision, because I don't want to bias you in any way. Okay, so if you haven't come up with your answer yet, now would be a good time to pause the video, um, because I'm about to show you how everyone else responded. Okay, moving on. So here are the results that we got from the participants in our survey. As you can see, our participants were quite split over this question, and it's not just a minor split of the answer being a bit of a boundary case, so we get answers in the category either side. Uh, instead, what we see here is that there's some participants um, at the extreme not useful at all, whilst there's still participants saying that this exact very same review question is very useful. Um, so this becomes a major problem for any attempt to automatically classify reviews as helpful or unhelpful, uh, because no matter which way we were to classify a review like this, a lot of people are going to disagree. Um, so the question comes, do participants agree over any of the reviews at all? Um, or is it all just entirely random? So in order to quantify this amount of agreement, uh, we used a coefficient called Krippendorf's alpha. It's an inter-rater reliability metric, and for you, those of you who have done qualitative research before, it's quite similar to something you may have come across before called Cohen's kappa, uh, but this one generalizes slightly better to the case of multiple participants like we had. Uh, basically, all you need to know is a Krippendorf's alpha of one is perfect agreement. So that means for every review, participants come together um, and agree upon the same response for that review. A Krippendorf's alpha of zero means chance agreement. So there can still be some agreement just by pure chance. So for example, in our survey, most um, of our participants tended to consider reviews uh, slightly helpful. So just by chance, you'd expect there would be um, a lot of reviews where slightly helpful has sort of been the consensus just by pure chance. Um, so in order for that Krippendorf's alpha to be greater than zero, um, to indicate some sort of agreement, um, there needs to be this case where the review is actually changing people's opinions um, in order to actually bring about different consensuses for each review. So when we crunch the numbers, uh, our Krippendorf's alpha came out at 0 0.04, which is virtually nothing. Um, none to slight. Okay, uh, so what does this mean? Um, in summary, as I mentioned earlier, there are these very o general overall trends, uh, such as the longer reviews tended to be more helpful when we were to summarize the helpfulness ratings given by many participants for that particular review sort of as a vote. That said, when we look at any individual review, uh, we can see there's not a lot of agreement over the participants. That Krippendorf's alpha was coming out at virtually zero, meaning they're essentially just agreeing by chance independent of the review. 
um, there's just enough agreement for those very general overall trends to come out. Um, so this indicates that far from what I initially believed of helpfulness being something objective that we'd be able to measure, helpfulness is something that's very subjective and depends upon how, who you ask. Um, in terms of limitations, as I'm sure some of you are thinking, uh, we've only looked at the iOS health and fitness category um, and it does tend to have longer reviews so I would expect that the reviews in this category are generally more helpful. If we were to look at a different app marketplace and a different category with more spam then I would expect that users would probably be able to agree upon those reviews that are clearly spam and that would push that Krippendorf's alpha up. Uh, that said, once you filter out the clear spam reviews, you're back to the same problem of how to separate helpful from unhelpful. Um, this opens up the opportunity for a lot of future work. Um, we still don't understand fully why participants disagree so much, why they come to their conclusions. Uh, one possibility is there may be subgroups that still agree with each other. For example, developers might agree with each other and users might agree with each other. Um, but because of the distribution of our participants, where we had some developers and some ordinary users, uh, those conflicting groups may have cancelled out any agreement. Um, unfortunately, because of the way we aggregated the results in our survey, we weren't able to look at those individual demographics of individual people. Um, so that's something that would be interesting to investigate into the future. Um, and although I think at this point we can safely rule out any hope of a one-size-fits-all usefulness slash helpfulness classifier, there still remains the possibility that perhaps we could develop some sort of personalised helpfulness estimate for the particular person who wants to find helpful or unhelpful reviews. Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, let me know below if you have any questions or comments and thanks for watching.